Carl Sagan once said, to make an apple pie from scratch, you must first invent the universe. We have learned a little bit about our place in the universe, and that we inhabit a rocky planet called Earth, orbiting an average star that we call our sun, which is part of a larger collection of stars in our Milky Way galaxy. And our Milky Way galaxy is just one of hundreds of billions of other galaxies in our universe. You may be wondering, how did all this stuff come to exist? So in this lesson, we'll do a brief, fast tour through 14 billion years of cosmic history. Scientists believe the universe came into existence in what they call the Big Bang. Someone once said, in the beginning, there was nothing which exploded. How exactly that happened is an open question. Now, why do scientists think that the universe had this origin? Well, recall that Edwin Hubble, using the telescope on Mount Wilson there, observed that galaxies, these splotches of light seen in this more recent modern Hubble Space Telescope picture, galaxies are moving away from each other. There's no center of the expansion, but all galaxies are moving away from each other as though space itself were expanding. And so this led to the idea that, well, if all galaxies today are moving away from each other in the past, the universe must have been smaller and smaller until you get to some point where, well, what did it originate from? And hence so we get back to the concept of the Big Bang. This was the origin of matter, energy, space, and time some 13.8 billion years ago. Now, as the universe expanded, it cooled. In, the, in these early times of the universe, there was tremendous quantities of energy packed into the small volume of the universe. And we can think of energy in general as the potential for something to happen. Well, as the universe expanded and cooled, the energy transformed into particles of matter. In fact, uh, Einstein's famous equation E equals mc squared shows us that matter and energy are two sides of the same coin. We can think of matter as the stuff that energy pushes around. Several of the forces of nature, the nuclear forces and electrical forces, assembled simple atoms like hydrogen and helium. So in the beginning, the only elements really present in the early universe were hydrogen and helium with small amounts of lithium. Now, what are these elements? You've probably seen a periodic table like this. Elements are substances composed of one kind of atom. Hydrogen here circled over here is the most abundant element in the universe. It's also the simplest atom. Helium is the next most abundant element, and it is the next simplest atom. Atoms, you may already know, are tiny, tiny particles composed of subatomic particles like protons in the nucleus of the atom and electrons uh, surrounding the nucleus of the atom. Uh, and atoms differ. Their identity is determined by the number of protons in the nucleus of the atom. Now, what I'm not showing here are neutrons. Neutrons are needed in atoms that have more than one proton. Since protons are positively charged, they would, they would push away from each other. Neutrons are necessary to keep the protons together in the nucleus of the atom. But I'm not showing the neutrons in these atoms here. So hydrogen is the simplest atom. It is just one positively charged proton and one negatively charged electron surrounding it. Helium has two protons, lithium three. Notice the number of electrons matches the number of protons in the nucleus of the atom. So in the beginning then, it was really just about 75% hydrogen and about almost 25% helium. Now these giant clouds of hydrogen and helium are going to be future galaxies. Today we know of galaxies as these beautiful structures out in space. We know they're composed of hundreds of billions of stars. So we can think of a galaxy then as a collection of stars. So now we need to understand how the first stars formed. Well, here we have the ever pervasive force of gravity is going to condense small pockets of hydrogen and helium into the first stars. 
So what's happening here is that as the temperatures and pressures inside the core of the star get so hot, the hydrogen atoms are going to fuse to make helium atoms. And that process called neutral, nuclear fusion releases energy. But in addition, as uh, hydrogen gets exhausted, then the stars can start to fuse helium. And they go through this, this uh, set of reactions that creates new and heavier kinds of atoms, new elements, as it were. Let's return to our simple diagrams of atoms. Here we have again hydrogen, helium, lithium. Well, stars are composed of the two simplest types of atoms, but inside the star, in the core of the star, these simple atoms are being smashed together to form heavier atoms. We say an atom is heavier if it has more protons in the nucleus of the atom. And so you can sort of see that a, a simple atom like hydrogen with one proton, you can make helium out of hydrogen. You just gotta smash some hydrogens together and then you can make helium. And if you smash heliums together, you can make atoms with more protons in the nucleus. So stars are element factories. In the cores of stars, new and heavier elements are being forged from hydrogen and helium. Over here on the right, here's our star here, and I've just drawn out some of these uh, elements. They have a different number of protons, that's what makes them different. Uh, and all these different kinds of elements were made by stars. In addition, when stars exhaust their fu uh, fuel, th some of them, if they're large enough, can undergo colossal explosions called supernova, and we'll return to that in a second. But this idea that stars are element factories are really important because when we think about our planet Earth and what it is made of, it's made of heavy elements. So if we just take the crust of the Earth here, here's a pie chart showing what are the most uh, common elements found in the crust of the Earth. Well, oxygen, silicon, aluminum, iron, calcium, etc. Well, all of these types of atoms were forged inside stars. So planets owe their existence to the earlier work of stars. Returning to our story, when stars exhaust their fuel, if they're big enough, they, they can undergo a colossal explosion called a supernova. And this is how all those new elements made by stars can be redistributed back out into space to form new planets. In fact, this is a picture of a supernova remnant, Cassiopeia A, and scientists estimate that the material shown in this picture, the, the ejected material would be enough to make 70,000 Earth masses of iron. So you could make 70,000 more Earths in the amount of iron that was ejected from this uh, supernova. It's got one million Earth masses of oxygen. So all the oxygen on Earth, there's one million times that amount of oxygen in this single supernova. So what supernova are doing are ejecting all of these newly forged elements back out into space. So here we see in this picture a supernova and all the and some of the heavy elements are now mixing with a nearby cloud of hydrogen and helium gas. In addition, the shock wave of supernovas can compress this nearby uh, cloud and that will help new stars form in this region. This cloud here mixed with the cloud of hydrogen mixed with the uh, heavier elements. This is what we mean by space dust. Gas and dust is a nebula. So a nebula is a giant cloud of gas, mostly hydrogen and some helium, mixed with this space dust, which would be the heavy elements forged by stars and ejected out into space uh, by supernova. So now we have the uh, potential to make the second generation of stars, but we've got a mix of heavy elements here. And that's going to allow for the formation of planets around these next generation stars. So the star will be formed from uh, the hydrogen and helium gas, but the heavy elements will tend to aggregate into small particles and then little rocks and then bigger rocks and ultimately planets. So we could describe it this way, charged particles and small molecules form space dust. That's what this dust stuff is. And then gravity pulls the space dust together to form rocks, asteroids, and then planets. This would be a, a picture, sort of an early formation of a solar system. This is not a picture, it's an artist's rendering. But we see bits of pieces, rock and ice and such, and gravity will assemble them into planets. And so we get the first solar systems.
So these weren't the first stars. Remember, the first stars were just stars. There were no planets because there were no heavy elements yet made. But once one and two and three generations of stars, they explode, you've got enough material, enough of the heavy elements to make uh, planets around the next generation of stars. And in the picture on the right here, we see, again, sort of the origin of a solar system. We've got a nebula here. We've got hydrogen, helium, gas to make a star. We've got heavy elements to make rocky-like planets. And we get the formation of a solar system. Now, in our case, surrounding our sun we've got our planets and the earth happens to be at just uh, a distance from the sun so that water can exist as, as a liquid on its surface and uh, the scientists call this the habitable zone if we take a look back to our, our picture of our solar system uh, it may extend you know maybe a bit past uh, venus to out to sort of mars in this area water can exist as a liquid on the surface so you'll recall there's no liquid now on mars because it's it's uh, conditions have changed but early in mars's history there appears to have been running water so liquid water on its surface well this uh habitable zone then where water can exist it provides great conditions for lots of interesting chemistry to occur and uh, of course what from what we know of, about life on earth we know that life on earth requires water because inside of our cells there's lots of chemistry going on and water is a great solvent for all that chemistry so the story then is that in the beginning there was no life on earth but there was lots of interesting chemistry going on and out of that those chemical processes life emerges so if we think about then our relationship to the rest of the universe we can think of it this way since life emerged on planet earth all living things on earth are also made of star stuff let's recall the relationships stars in the beginning just hydrogen helium they make heavy elements and then when they explode even heavier elements are made so the supernova explosions are going to distribute those heavy elements back out into space to be incorporated in next generation solar systems stars with planets and on some of those planets if they're in the habitable zone chemistry can occur that ultimately produces life we know it has happened once in our galaxy don't know if it's happened uh, at other locations but if there are other intelligent civilizations in our galaxy and if we were ever to communicate with them we would have a lot of shared history because after all our story this 13.8 billion year story is their story too so if we got together we would be able to compare our notes we would be able to share this universal history that all living things in our galaxy went through this common cosmic history